Dr. Rakesh Gar from uh, All India Institute, New Delhi. Uh, it's a very uh, prestigious occasion for RESA from the uh, so, uh, Vice President of uh, RESA Railway Association of ISA. I invite you all to this uh, grand academic program as guest lecture on online DNB activities, academic activities of RESA. Today we have with us Professor Rakesh Gar. Uh, he requires uh, no introduction to any anesthesia, even first year student, because he's so popular among in the students of uh, the field of anesthesia, intensive care, pain medicine, resuscitation, you name it and everywhere he is very popular. Not only in the academic activities, in research and publications and all the other uh, social and administrative fields also, his name is so popular and we are lucky to have him with us today. And uh, he is very good teacher, uh, teacher, good teacher as the mark of making things look so simple and easy. And in addition to that, it makes he makes a very good connection with the basics um, of anesthesia and physics and uh, research and clinical uh, integration of research and theory with the clinical application of our science. So I requested him for to be to deliver a guest lecture on vaporizers and anesthesia. So he's always very. Uh, enthusiastic and uh, is uh, my mo motivation to adapt to any particular uh, teaching levels and uh, deliver the exact message required by the students. It is uh, so uh, nice and uh, kind to join us today and I request uh, our uh, Professor Rakesh Gar to give his uh, presentation on vaporizers for the benefit of our RISA members and students. Over to Dr. Rakesh Gar. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And uh, I must thank uh, you and your whole team for giving this opportunity to be part of uh, the Railways Association uh, academic events that we have been doing for long. And uh, for you all the students who are working uh, in various capacities in various hospitals or railways. So thank you so much. And uh, as suggested, I will be taking you through, uh, through the vaporizer. So, uh, since many of you are uh, residents and youngsters, I'll take you through a little uh, basic aspects also, and then I'll take you through the recent, uh, most updated vaporizers, which are available in more recent workstations, uh, which will be useful to you. So, so I can request uh, uh, Sir, uh, whenever he thinks that I'm overshooting the time, uh, you can just interrupt because sometimes I flow into the uh, slides and may take a little more longer time. So whenever you think the time is over, just interrupt, I can stop there. It will be a uh, pleasure to hear you more, sir, more from you, sir. Anyway, thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, are the slides visible, sir? Yes. Thank you. Yes, visible, visible. Thank you, sir. So uh, let me take you through the vaporizer because uh, when we talk of vaporizer, I think uh, if you see these photographs, you must have seen these uh, vaporizers starting from the, uh, I can say, ancient times uh, of the anesthetic practice, to the most recent time uh, with the anesthesia workstations that we have. So these have been the uh, journey of vaporizers that we have been using. Um, to the evolution of anesthesia practice. And they have been uh, increasingly number of uh, safety features and the, uh, you can see the technical aspect of the construction of these vaporizers have changed a lot so that uh, you can give a very controlled uh, delivery of uh, various anesthetic agents during the anesthetic practice. And that's why if you see the complicated uh, vaporizers, uh, if you see the first figure, it was just a simple uh, wire and mesh with some uh, cotton uh, wrap with some bottles that can deliver the anesthetic agents. Then they become a little bigger one, uh, which were more of a mechanical aspect, uh, but then subsequently they were more of an electronic uh, incorporation with more of a safety features into this. And this is how these uh, vaporizers have evolved. So I will just take you in brief uh, through all those things. These are uh, important from not only from exam point of view, but these are also important from the clinical practice point of view, because if you go across India, uh, these vaporizers, uh, different types will be used at different places. If you go in very remote areas in the peripheries, even a uh, little older type of vaporizers are still being used because they don't put vaporizers. And if you see the uh, latest RSEA workstation, uh, like uh, the jet injectors and the uh, cassette type of vaporizers are being used, which have 
a lot of electronic components along with computer based uh, deliveries, which are incorporated into these workstations. So I'm getting greetings from my institute. Now, when we talk about the vaporizer, why do we need a vaporizer or what actually is a vaporizer? It's an instrument which is designed to facilitate the change of liquid anesthetic into its vapor. Now, if I stop at this definition, then even the oldest vaporizer can do the same. Uh, but if you see the recent ones, what we need to do is we need to add a controlled amount of this vapor to the flow of gases. This means it's just not the uh, change of liquid anesthetic into its vapor. You can just open the bottle, uh, heat it up, it will convert, a liquid will convert into vapor. But we need an equipment that can add a controlled amount. And that is what the vaporizer do where you, you can set the settings, 1%, 2%, whatever you want to set. So this should be controlled because you are giving to the patient in a controlled environment. You want to titrate the amount of anesthetic vapor to be delivered to the patient, and hence you need some vaporizer. And uh, this is a conventional definition, but from my point of view, we can add on further that this controlled amount of this vapor to the flow of gases should also have certain safety features so that whatever we are delivering, whatever we are controlling is actually being given to the patient. And that safety features of the newer anesthetic uh, agents and the vaporizers are one of the desirable, one of the, I can say, even mandatory requirement of using this vaporizer from the safety point of view. So this means when we say vaporizer, what it functions actually is, it produces vaporization of the liquid volatile anesthetic agent. And now there has to be some carrier gas. And this is usually a fresh gas flow, which could be a mixture of oxygen, air, oxygen or oxygen nitroxide, whatever it is. And it makes vapor, that is the anesthetic vapor, with the fresh gas flow and control the mixture despite variables. Despite variables, I mean that whether you are increasing the flow from four liters per minute to 15 liters per minute, but the delivery of the anesthetic agent should be controlled. And to deliver safe and accurate concentrations of inhalation anesthetic agents to the patient. So this is uh, a basic, uh, you can say, definition, function, uh, the requirement of the vaporizers that we are using. Now, if we see any of these vaporizers, there are certain physics behind it. And as anesthesiologists, we should be aware of uh, these physics also because these are important. When we talk of the first uh, vaporizer related physics, it is the critical temperature. Because all those uh, anesthetic agents will be in one phase, needs to be converted to second phase. And that's why uh, this terminology of critical temperature comes up. It is simply defined as a temperature above which no amount of pressure will convert a gas to a liquid. And this is uh, required for uh, agents like nitrous oxide. And uh, based on this, uh, this usually defines as vapor or gas. Vapor means gaseous phase of an agent, which is normally a liquid at room temperature and atmospheric pressure. And gas is substance which exists only in gaseous state at room temperature and atmospheric pressure. So this is the basic difference with when we say the volatile agent uh, vapors, not as gases. And when we say oxygen uh, or nitrous oxide as a gas, not as a vapor. So this is how we need to differentiate, and this is based on the critical temperature. The second terminology, which is uh, very commonly used in these vaporizers are the vapor pressure. Now, if you simply understand that when a particular molecule of a volatile liquid is enclosed in a container, it breaks away to form the vapor. And the pressure with which each molecule, which has been broken up from liquid to the vapor form, bombards the walls of the container. And obviously, as I just mentioned in the previous slide, that this will depend upon the temperature and nature of the kit. This will depend upon the, uh, this will lead to something called vapor pressure. The vapor pressure on a agent determines how much of vapor will be formed from one ml of the liquid anesthetic agents. Now, since different anesthetic agents have different pre uh, vapor pressures, this means I said in the initial beginning slide, the controlled delivery. And hence, that's why the, that's the reason is, if you see the newer vaporizers, you have separate vaporizers for each liquid anesthetic agent. Because each gas, whether you talk of isofluorine, sevofluorine, desfluorine, halothane, whatever agents, these are the usual, usually commonly used agents, 
they have different vapor pressures. We want a controlled delivery, and hence there is a need for separate vaporizers for each of these gases. The next terminology that we use is this saturated vapor pressure. Now, this is the maximum vapor pressure at a particular temperature. And if you know uh, the various uh, liquid anesthetic agents that I just mentioned, they will have different saturated vapor pressure. The saturated vapor pressure of most anesthetic uh, inhalation agents is much more than is required to produce anesthesia. For example, if you talk of the halothane, uh, it is 32% versus 0.75, which is clinically required. So this means when we say the saturated vapor pressure is much more than required, this means we need to dilute this vapor into some carrier gas flows. And that's why we use uh, agents like uh, the oxygen, the nitrous oxide, and we try to dilute them because we do not need such higher percentages of the uh, vapors uh, to be delivered to the patient. So you can easily understand that these are, uh, even if you talk of the halothane, these are uh, one of the potent agents because they can deliver much more than is required. And hence we require a vaporizer to have a controlled delivery of these and the use of carrier gas, including oxygen, nitrous oxide, or even mixture helps you to dilute this and has to deliver the calculated or the desirable amount of, say, for example, 0.75% of halothane to these patients through the vaporizers. The other term that we use is the boiling point. Boiling point of a liquid, because most of these are into liquid phase, it is that temperature at which the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. This is a very physical uh, physics uh, definition. And the lower the atmospheric pressure, the lower the boiling point. And hence, uh, many of the times when you go in a high altitude, that's why uh, these uh, agents, liquid agents, will start boiling at lower boiling point because the atmospheric pressure would be low. And you can just remember, uh, this may be uh, no, clinically relevant and may be asked in exams also. You can just remember that uh, uh, which of the agents have highest uh, saturated vapor pressure and the lowest boiling point, which is the dust fluorine. And hence, you need a special, a special vaporizer because uh, just at uh, 23 degrees Celsius, it can boil up. And it's, uh, that's why saturated vapor pressure is very high, maximum of 669 millimeter of mercury at 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, you need to remember these uh, saturated vapor pressures, readings, and boiling points of uh, these uh, uh, agents. The other uh, terminology which are required for the purpose of the making of vaporizers. Because these vaporizers, if you think, if you have seen these vaporizers, uh, especially the tech vaporizers, you, you must have seen that they are very heavy. This means they require a specific uh, material to prepare these vaporizers. They cannot be made with any material because they require certain specific requirements which are based on these definitions, which I am discussing in the next couple of seconds. The heat of vaporization. It is the number of calories need to convert one gram or one mils of liquid to vapor. Because when these liquid agents are changed into vapors, they will require some energy. They will require some calories and that needs to be delivered. Who will deliver it? Probably the atmosphere probably the content or the material of the vaporizer, or in some of the vaporizers, there will be some heating source. If you use the material, then it needs to be quantified in the form of specific heat. The quantity of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram or one mils of substance by one degree Celsius. And thermal conductivity, the measure of speed with heat, heat flows to a substance. So this specific heat and thermal conductivity and also the thermal capacity, which is amount of heat stored in vaporizer body. So these terminologies, specific heat, thermal conductivity and thermal capacity is primarily related to the material of the vaporizer. And hence, a proper material is chosen for constructing these vaporizers so that the heat is appropriately delivered to the anesthetic agents, which is in liquid form inside these vaporizers and this can be, uh, this number of calories can be provided to the liquid agent so that they are converted into vapor and delivered to the patient. And this is essential when you now understand. So this means the vaporizers, the material of the vaporizer should have high thermal conductivity and specific heat. 
when they have high thermal conductivity and specific heat, this means they will store more heat and they can allow from atmosphere for the heat to be transferred through these material to the liquid anesthetic agent. And hence, these vaporizers are made of special materials, which are usually uh, copper, bronze, or combination. And more recently, the combination of bronze and stainless steel, because these agents, these materials have high thermal conductivity and high specific heat. And this is a desirable property of the vaporizer uh, maintenance. Now, other aspect is, as I just mentioned, when the liquid agent is converted to the vapor agent, they will require the need of heat or the calories. Now, if they're constantly taking up the calories, there has to be some system of thermostabilization, right? So how this is being done? The vaporizer is constructed of metal with high thermal conductivity, just mentioned. Heavy metal parts act as a high reservoir. That's why if you see those tech vaporizers, they are very heavy. These vaporizers have wicks in the contact with the metal part inside the vaporizer so that the heat loss inside is usually taken up from the material of the vaporizer. And sometimes uh, the vaporizer chamber is uh, immersed in a large mass of water. This was done for older vaporizers, not being done for the newer vaporizers. Now, one aspect is thermostabilization, but sometimes it is not sufficient. Then we need to have something called thermocompensation. Now, what we do is, uh, uh, th these are the thermocompensation are the measures to maintain the vaporizer output constant despite con temperature change. But when you are using vaporizer, heat will be continuously taken up by the liquid anesthetic agents and changed into the vapor. So this means there is a continuous need of heat, but the metal or the atmosphere will have some specific amount. So at which time, the temperature will go down. If you see the older vaporizers, after use, they get have some, you know, uh, they, are, they are very cool from outside after use because all the energy, all the heat has been absorbed by the liquid anesthetic agent to get convert liquid into vapor. So this means the metal becomes cold. If it becomes cold, if there are no further heat, then the heat required to change liquid into vapor will not be there. If it is not there, then the vapor will not be formed. If vapor will not be formed, this means output will decrease. But this is not acceptable in a clinical practice. That's why we need just not thermostabilization, but thermocompensation. And how thermocompensation is done? In the vaporizers, there are certain uh, uh, no, construction-related issues, which is called as automatic compensation or electronic compensation or manually compensation or electrical compensation. So automatic compensation, I'll show you diagram a little later in which uh, they have something called a splitting ratio. So whenever the temperature goes a little lower, the vapor content or the vapor chamber opens more so that even small quantity which is being converted into from liquid to vapor can mix in a higher amount because now the exit is open, more open. And this is something called splitting ratio. But now more recently, uh, we are using more of an electronic vaporizers, which automatically detects decrease in the temperature, decrease in the conversion of the vapors, uh, liquid into vapor, and then they control those uh, output from that point. In some of the uh, vaporizers like Draeger vapor, if you see the round uh, vaporizers, uh, which is uh, uh, available, uh, which is in the driver machine, uh, they, are, they have some system of manually adjusting, but now we're not using them because we have more of an electronic, uh, electronically monitored and controlled vaporizers available to us. Also, sometimes some of the vaporizers like Tech 6, they have electrically heated components. So they have some electric uh, uh, capacitors inside it, which converts the, or which supplies or delivers the heat constantly so that inside temperature is maintained and a constant delivery of or the constant conversion of liquid anesthetic agent into vapor continuously happen in these patients and this is supply height. So these are the basic mechanisms uh, the vaporizers works and we need to understand them appropriately because inside the operating room, the temperature is usually kept low 23 or 25 degrees Celsius and hence uh, the delivery may be affected and these are the mechanisms that are available with our vaporizers to deliver 
a desirable known amount of vapors to the patients. The other terminology that we use is the partial pressure. The partial pressure is the part of the total pressure to due to any one gas in the mixture. So we say partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere, partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood gas analysis. Similarly, will be the partial pressure of a particular agent like sevo fluorin inside the whole gas mixture that we are delivering to the patient. And it depends upon nature of the liquid, temperature, and it does not. It does not depend on ambient pressure, whether you are doing it here or you are doing on mountains. So the partial pressure will not change, right? So it is not dependent upon it. Though we said that uh, the boiling point will change, but the partial pressure is not dependent on the ambient pressure. Now, why we are talking about because the patient uptake and the anesthetic depth are directly related to partial pressure. But I will talk about the, the uh, particular agent, for example, say, let's see if we say this much partial pressure is required at alveolar level for appropriate depth of anesthesia. This much partial pressure is required at brain level for appropriate depth of anesthesia. So, this is the significance when we talk about the partial pressure of an volatile anesthetic agent. Now, these are the uh, uh, terminology that we use more commonly, which is called MAC, that is minimum alveolar concentration, that are also on your monitors uh, when you observe them and you deliver them. And this is simply uh, called as the inhaled anesthetic, the alveolar concentration that prevents movement in 50% of patients in response to a surgical incision stimulus. So this is, uh, this is required for our clinical practice. And the MAC values you should remember, for example, it is 0.75 for halothane and it is 6.4 for desflurane. So you should be uh, remembering these MAC values of various agents. And you should also remember certain other terminology with regards to MAC, that MAC awake, MAC sleep, uh, so uh, MAC incision. So these are the various MAC values that has been used in clinical practice when we talk about the MAC of a particular anesthetic agent. Now, Let's move towards the vaporizers. So when we see vaporizers, starting from the older vaporizers to newer vaporizers, the terminology or the type of vaporizers are primarily you know, divided upon based on their working principle. If the fresh gas flow is pushed into the vaporizer with high resistance, these are called plenum type of vaporizers. If the gas is pulled into the vaporizer by the patient's own inspiratory effort, and these were common with the older vaporizers like Goldman or EMOs, and these are called drawer vaporizers. And in a drawer vaporizer with the carrier gas is air. So uh, we'll come to these uh, vaporizers subsequently. Now, if you see the classification of vaporizers, uh, there's nothing called oldest uh, or older or newer classification. I've just tried to put it uh, based on the uh, uh, previous books and the newer books, because as the new technology has emerged, the classification of vaporizers have changed. So this is, uh, uh, I have coined these terms as oldest, older, and uh, newer classification of vaporizers based on their evolution. If you see the, uh, uh, the almost say three or four decades back, the vaporizers were divided based on these five classifications. So if you name any vaporizer, you need to describe based on these five characteristics, that how do they have a method of regulating output concentration, which was as variable bypass measure flow, as methods of vaporization, as flow over, bubble through, flow over, or bubble through, location outside the breathing system, inside the breathing system, temperature compensation, none by supplied heat, by flow alteration, and specificity, that whether they were agent specific, or a single vaporizer can be used for multiple agents. But as the things emerged, uh, there were some changes, uh, especially uh, the newer vapor, uh, the slightly newer vaporizers, where they have changed into the uh, temperature compensation and the resistance. And then there was uh, the A, B, and E remains the same, but in resistance, they were uh, earlier it was uh, like uh, uh, not mentioned, but when they have more safety features, they were mentioned as resistance with plenum or low resistance. And the temperature compensation, thermal compensation supplied heat was a newer modality of controlling the output. And if you see the newer classification, because most of them are electronics so now, all new vaporizers can be classified based on these three characteristics. Method of regulating output concept, variable bypass, and electronic. 
method of vibration and lower or injection technique, temperature compensation based on mechanical supplied heat or computerized. So this is if you talk about any like, for example, say allergen cassette or you talk about the newer uh, desplane vaporizer. These are the characteristics based on which you need to describe these vaporizers, especially in exams, but also for your knowledge that how these are actually working. These uh, new uh, vaporizers are all out of circuit and agent specific. That's why the previous two uh, where they were out of circuit, inside circuit, agent specific, agent non-specific classic pick here have been removed because uh, all these newer vaporizers are specific for a particular agent. They cannot be intermixed with other agent. If something is for sevofluorine, you can only add sevofluorine into it. You cannot use it for isofluorine. So the agent specific and they are used in out of circuit. So if you see, these all are mounted onto your uh, anesthetic machines back part, and uh, they are they are uh, away from the uh, total circle circuit that you're using. So they are out of circuit. This is our three classification. So I just leave it uh, for a moment uh, to all of you. Just look at the differences so that you can uh, remember them uh, you know, uh, for your exams and for your understanding also. Right, so we'll move forward. So now I think uh, we have covered the physics. We have covered the classification of these vaporizers. Now let's see the methods of regulating output concentration, how these vaporizers actually work. Sometimes we say 1%, sometimes 3%, sometimes a 5%. So how actually the vaporizers works from inside. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the classification uh, has been mentioned. So now let's see that how this output is maintained in a variable bypass it is also called as direct reading concentration calibrated dial controlled automatic plenum because you see if you if you just uh, uh, if you are using electronic models if you just change it from say 1% to 2% the uh, output will change or uh, if you use the vaporizer based uh, where the the computerized system is not there you turn on the dial and change the percentage required for these patients so this is how you you try to change the concentration so how actually it changes Right. So if you see this diagram now in this diagram, this is how the fresh gas flow will go in. Uh, this is a very basic uh, uh, diagram. This is how the fresh gas flow goes in. This is the control trial where you set some settings as 1%, 2% or 3%. And then it has a splitting wall. Some of the fresh gas flow will go through the bypass channel and directly goes to the patient. Of this fresh gas flow, some will be splitted and go into the vaporizing chamber, which has the anesthetic agent. Now, when this fresh gas flow goes through the vaporizing chamber, this will pick up the anesthetic gases. So liquid gas will change into vapors. Vapors are present there. We talked about the saturated vapor pressures. So these vapors will be available here. So this fresh gas flow, which contains anesthetic agents will be picked up by the fresh gas flow and they will come out to the exit and they will mix with the bypass pathway and this mixture will go to the patient. So this means this fresh gas flow at the input, at the inlet, and then when it's go outlet, it will be having the uh, anesthetic vapors into it. So this is this is what is decided that how much uh, fresh gas flow should be splitted between the bypass and the splitting wall, and it depends upon the control dial. Higher the control dial, more amount of fresh gas flow will go through the vaporizing chamber and hence will pick more amount of anesthetic gases. So this means higher control dial, you want higher vapors. This means higher gas, higher fresh gas will flow through the vaporizing chamber. And this is what is the variable bypass because you are variably dividing the fresh gas flow into the bypass and the vaporizing chamber as per your clinical need. So this is called as variable bypass. And this we use in many of our uh, newer vaporizers that we're using. So this is a very 
uh, simplified way of understanding that how it actually happens. Now, this splitting ratio, this splitting ratio that I mentioned, this splitting wall, how it actually works. Sorry. How it actually works. Now, this splitting ratio will depend upon the resistance of two pathways, which in turn depends upon the variable orifice of the inlet and outlet. And this usually depends upon the temperature and flow rate. Because I mentioned temperature, more temperature, more vapors. Less temperature after some time, less vapors. So that's why this will splitting ratio will depend upon temperature. Similarly, flow rates. We have second say percentage of two percent. If you are using ten liters versus two liters, two liters to saturate to two percent will require less vapors. But to saturate ten liters to two percent of an acidic agent, it will require more vapors to be mixed up, and hence. The splitting ratio will depend upon these features also, which are decided by the vaporizers and its electronic system in the newer vaporizers automatically. So this is how it works like. I'll just show you once again. So when we say vi variable bypass, right? Say so the dial is totally closed, whatever you deliver goes to the patient. Once you open the vaporizer, the vaporizer is turned on. You can see here the vaporizer is turned on. The splitting ratio will decide that some of the gases will directly bypass and go to the patient and some of the gases will go into the vaporizing chamber and go to the patient. So this is how the uh, splitting uh, happens once you open up the, uh, the dials of the vaporizers. Now you can see that if you increase your dial more, right? Suppose this is 1%, this is 3%, 1%, 3%. If you can see here, if you open your dial more, this means more amount of flows will go through the vaporizing chamber and hence more will be delivered to the patient. And that's why we have certain high setting. So this is how majority of the vaporizers works by variable bypass system. Now this is measured flow. I may not be going into detail because this is not most commonly used now in which uh, here I, uh, it, the system that is being used is a measured flow of carrier gas to pick up the agent. Uh, this requires a cumbersome uh, calculations and this were in older vaporizers and are not more commonly used nowadays. What we use nowadays are the electronic vaporizers where computer software controls by calculating carrier gas flow through the vaporizing chamber. So it sets a 10 liters of flow, it will pick automatically. The moment you keep the MAC value, you need to be kept as 2 or 3 or 4 depending upon what agent you are using it. It will automatically calculate the splitting ratio and Hence, divides the carrying gas flow through the vaporizing chamber and the bypass. In some of the vaporizer, uh, which is based on injection technique, they will pick a calculated volume of the liquid agent and they will inject into the fresh gas flow, which mix, get vaporizes and deliver to the patient. So these are the newer techniques that are being used for the method of vaporization, right? So this is how it is delivery, right? Now it's some methods of vaporization which actually happens. Now these are three ways that happens, flow over, bubble through injection, and now new vaporizers use the injection technique. Let me show you each. Flow over means the fresh gas flow will just you know, go through the vaporizing chamber and they will pick up. So the gas is flowing over the liquid surface. And how can we increase the liquid surface? We can, you know, insert some wicks, right? These are wicks which absorbs, like the, the way we uh, know on our auspicious occasion, we burn dia, uh, we lights up dias, so it picks up oil and it, you know, uh, gives us light. Similarly, this uh, this wicks will pick up the liquid acidic agent, increasing the surface area, and hence, even if you want to give a higher uh, MAC of these agents, you can easily uh, give through that. And this will depend upon uh, various, uh, uh, no, the efficacy will depend upon whether you are using wicks, uh, how much is the flow, how much is the height of gas flow, and uh, how much is the area into the vaporizer, and these will affect the method of vaporization. In bubble through, what happens if you want to increase? More, right? You want to deliver more. So if you inject the fast gas flow into the liquid itself, right? You must have seen it. If you bubble uh, through a straw into a water, the water sprinkles more, right? So same thing happens in vaporizer also. In this, the fresh gas flow is bubbled through the liquid aerosetic agents, which increases the surface area of the interaction of the fresh gas flow molecules with the anesthetic agents. And hence, 
the delivery of the anesthetic agents can be increased further on. So this is called the third. The third is the injection, which is uh, in the newer vaporizers like Macway, uh, Macway anesthetic uh, uh, workstations. So they use an injection technique in which, based on whatever the dial setting of the anesthetic agents you have set, and the amount of gas flows, the fresh gas flows you are doing, it will calculate the amount of liquid agents required. It will pick that agent and it will inject into the fresh gas flow, which gets converted into vapors and delivered to the patient. So this is called injection technique of method of vaporization. So I'm sure I'm, I think I'm not going too fast. Is it okay? Uh, somebody can say yes or no. Yes, yes, it's okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Continue. Thank you. So let's come to the next feature of the vaporizer that works with is called temperature compensation. So I mentioned earlier that whenever the liquid is changed into vapors, it uses heat, it uses energy. So this means with time the vaporizer will become more cool. If it becomes cool, this means it will not convert liquid into vapors. This means after some time, the vaporizer should deliver less. But then in clinical practice, we want it should not deliver less. It should deliver whatever we want. So this means all the vaporizers have some mechanisms, which is called temperature compensation. And now how this temperature compensation happens? Let's see this uh, uh, photograph. Now, this is uh, the first uh, picture shows, uh, first picture shows at the start of our case when we have just started it. If you see the temperature will be good because I'm going to talk here so my thermal conductivity, uh, the storage of energy into the uh, into the uh, see components of the vaporizer. So temperature is, you can see temperature is high here and it is delivering the desirable amount of molecule. But as the case proceeds, the temperature will fall down because the heat in the vaporizer has been taken up by the molecules to convert from liquid to vapors. And as the temperature goes down, now when the temperature goes down, the liquid will change into vapor in lesser quantity. So you can see here, when temperature is high, you can see more of these pink molecules. But now when temperature goes down, lesser of pink molecules. So this happens into the clinical practice if there is no temperature compensation. Now this is the physical aspect. Now what, these, uh, what we have done it so that the delivery is not decreased. So what can be done? So there are three methods here. Automatic compensation, supplied heat, computer control. Automatic, I mentioned earlier, splitting ratio. Supply heat, like in Tech 6, they have um, the electric coils, which levers heat. And computer control, which electronically see if the output is low, they will maintain some change into the vaporizers to deliver the constant amount. Now, this is what is the bimetallic strip. Now, you can see this is the inside of the vaporizer. Now, this is a bimetallic strip. Now, this is made of uh, a thermosensitive element, right? The moment the temperature decreases, this bimetallic strip will bend towards this side. Once this bends this side, this opening is more. This means more of the fresh gas flow will now come into the vaporizing chamber. I said in the beginning, more gas goes to the vaporizing chamber, it will pick more. Now, since with temperature, there are less molecules, but if we increase the fresh gas flow, it will pick more molecules and hence the output will be same. That is the basic purpose of bimetallic strip. It is made of combination of two metals, which changes the shape with the change in temperature. So low temperature, it opens more, with less temperature, it opens less. This is how this bimetallic strip, which is component of a true thermosensitive elements works on. So this is in a, in a larger picture. So when the high temperature is there, this bends like this, and hence a lesser space is there for the fresh gas flow to go into the vaporizer chamber. On low temperature, more spaces opens up because it goes to the other side. The input or the inlet into the vaporizer chamber opens more. More fresh gas flows go into the vaporizing chamber and hand it picks more and hence a constant delivery. So this is called bimetallic strip of temperature compensation. Now, there are other things that can affect it, flow rate, Temperature, outside temperature, pumping effect and pressure effect, I'm coming to it. Barometric pressure, anesthetic agent. So these are the other factors that will affect the performance of a vaporizer. Performance of vaporizer means 
the output of anesthetic agents be delivered to the patients. Now let's see what happens to the high flow. So the high flows, the vaporizer delivers less anesthetic agents. The reason is whenever the fresh gas flow goes into the vaporizer chamber, it should have some time to interact with it. If the flows are very high, they will have no uh, less chance of picking up the liquid agent which has converted to vapor and hence the delivery of the anesthetic agents will be less. So you should remember this one. And how can we increase this, uh, solve this problem? I mentioned about the wicks earlier, it increases surface area. So now they can interact better and hence the delivery will be better. And hence the newer agents have taken care of this problem. So now in the newer vaporizers, whatever the flows, whether we do a minimal flow or a high flow, they will try to deliver whatever we have set into the system. Now, next is the, the uh, bubbling through. Again, we want to have more interaction of the fresh gas flow with the liquid agent. So again, when we do a bubble through, as I mentioned earlier, again, it will solve the problem of high flows. Now, temperature. Temperature, I mentioned earlier, if the temperature lows goes down, less vapors, less delivery. So what have we done for it? We gave the heat, which happens in uh, newer vaporizers like Tech 6 and we also make material which are high thermal conductivity and high specific heat because they can store more energy. And this is how the newer vaporizers, you know, just try to control the constant output of the anesthetic agents. Also by thermal compensation, the splitting ratio, that this splitting ratio when the temperature goes down, this turns this side, opens more fresh gas flow into the vaporizing chamber and delivers more so that a constant outflow you can see is comparable. Now, the other thing is the back pressure because when we use a vaporizer, you also ventilate the patient. When you ventilate the patient, there will be some amount of back pressure changes that is delivered to the anesthesia workstation and also to the vaporizer. So what effect does it have? Let's see. Now, there are two effects, which is called pumping effect and pressizing effect. Pumping effect is also called as Hill and Law effect. And pressing effect is also called as Collage effect. Now, this is one of the important uh, um, theory question also, and this can be asked into your Viva OC also when you appear for your equipment Viva during the exam. And this is clinically important also because you should be checking your machine that the um, the one-way check wall at the outlet is functioning properly into your anesthesia workstation. If it is not, then this effect will be exaggerated. Now, the pumping effect is. The effect of changing pressure during ventilation, the positive pressure ventilation, it increases the output and this is called pumping effect, right? So this means whenever you try to ventilate the patient, this pumping effect will lead to increase in the output. And how does, it, how does this happen? Let's see. Now, usually I mentioned that when the fresh gas flows, something goes into the vaporizing chamber, something goes into the bypass channel, and then it's delivered to the patient. Now, when we try to ventilate the patient using the bag or the ventilator, what would happen is when you ventilate, yes, obviously, uh, some amount of gas will go towards the patient, but some amount of gas also goes back, right? If it goes back, this gas, if it goes back, what will happen is it will go into the both the channels. It will go into the vaporizing chamber and the bypass chamber, right? So when it goes into the bypass chamber, the more gas is available, which already has some amount of vapors. This means the fresh gas which is coming is more saturated. So when the flows go back during the expiration of the patient and the bag is get filled, so this patient will get more amount of anesthetic agents vapor because there was something itself, but something which has you know, saturated more and goes and bypass into this because you have done pumping effect, something has been pumped back into the system and this bypass channel vapors will also be delivered, which was normally not there, which has happened because of this pumping effect and hence more will be delivered to the patient. This is pumping effect. Now simultaneously, the pumping effect uh, uh, is also a, a, a phenomena which increases the delivered concentration. Now if you see the, uh, the uh, modification to reduce it, what they have done is at this bypass channel and the common gas outlet, this has been made larger. So, so the amount of gas will go into more of an, a bypass channel and hence less in vaporizing chamber. And then they can accommodate the back pressure changes. Or this inlet tube has been made long so that 
this vapor pressure goes go back and go into the bypass channel and hence the things becomes okay and more commonly uh, they have increased resistance so here the amount of the back pressure is not delivered to the vaporizing unit and hence it, it uh, uh, avoids the effect of pumping effect so this is what has changed and one way valve is the most latest and recent one where whatever you ventilate they have a one way check valve at the machine outlet and hence any amount of pressure will not go back and you are supposed to check your machine that this one way valve is working well simultaneously there is another mechanism called pressurizing effect which is also called pole effect now in this what happens is actually is if you remember earlier i said that the, the there is no change uh, because of the pressures on the vaporizers i said that the ambient pressure does not change anything so the other effect is so uh, when the pressurizing effect happens it decreases the output i said pumping increases pressurize decreases the output of parasitic agents in the vaporizers so what happened is whenever the uh, the ventilation is happening the gases will go back there will be some amount of increase in the pressure right but i said the partial pressure the ambient pressure does not change the output right though the pressure is increasing the number of molecules are increasing but the pressure increase in pressure is not going to change the vapor output and hence the output will decrease so this is called pressurizing effect but we have seen in the clinical practice that the pumping of this both effect will happen in the vaporizers pumping effect and both will happen simultaneously but it has been seen clinically that pumping effect is more than pressurizing effect and hence with the ventilation the chances of increased delivery is more because of pumping effect but in the newer machines because of the use of one way check valve even this pumping effect and the change in the modification of the vaporizer construction these effects are not seen in the newer vaporizers if your machine is well tested and well functional but if uh, you are using older machines this effect can happen now what are the other things that can affect the delivery of these agents most of these vaporizers are calibrated because aapne socha hoga ki so 1% ke 2% pe calibrate kiya gaya because you change the settings so they are calibrated they are calibrated on 100% oxygen but majority time will be using a combination of oxygen air or oxygen nitrous oxide and hence there will be some change if you add nitrous oxide there will be a temporary effect of decreasing the output when you start using it but once your liquid agent is saturated with nitrous oxide the output gradually increases but is less than before usually 10% less than with 100% nitrous oxide so this means with nitrous oxide will lead to decrease output of your anesthetic agent so whatever the dial setting that you have set will be decrease and that's why because of this reasons nowadays uh, rather than using mac or inspired concentration we are more monitoring on the expired concentration of anesthetic agents so that are more reliable because the inspired concentration can be changed because of all those parameters which we have discussing right now so that's why this means there will be a lot of variability and hence we are moving towards uh, monitoring of expired concentration because that will remain constant that is coming from the patient and hence it will be more important for us to know fresh gas flow a higher dial concentration and higher flow rates put may be less due to high flows i have already shown in the diagram earlier saturation may be incomplete high demand incomplete mixing and hence uh, you will have uh, high, at high dial concentration the vaporizer being delivered to the patients will be low similarly will be uh, very low flow rates because uh, the fresh gas flow molecules are very less they may not be able to pick up the volatile agent and hence at the extreme of flows the delivered output may be less as you have set on your dial settings the barometric pressures i said most of the vaporizers are calibrated at 100% oxygen at a standard atmospheric pressure so this means sometimes uh, the ambient pressure because the calibration is issue i am not talking about the vaporization calibration is done at atmospheric pressure so they may not be delivering the appropriate output at a particular dial setting so if you want to know that what is being delivered to the patient for a particular mac value or dial setting you can use this formula required dial setting is equal to the actual dial setting into 760 over ambient pressure that is wherever if you are working on mount everest and giving anesthesia you can use this to know that what would be the required dial setting for that particular agent based on the ambient pressure the effect of low pressures 
deliver high concentrations and for um, we are not using flow vaporizers, so we will not be discussing the same again. For higher atmospheric pressures, uh, for concentrated is calibrated, they will be having decreased vapor output. So this means if you go uh, under high pressure chambers or under sea anesthesia, then probably this will be uh, required. So, uh, so th there are some of us uh, who are working in these areas of uh, high altitude uh, uh, anesthesia practices, like some who are working in Leila Dark or uh, these areas, so they will be having these concerns, especially the, the uh, army professionals, army anesthesiologists are well versed with these about these uh, aspects. So this is a summary which I have just uh, described till now. I'm sure that uh, any questions till now, you can take up. Any queries or questions till now, now we'll move towards the next aspect. No questions in the chat box, sir. All right, perfect. Now we'll move to reverse the specific vaporizers. Now, uh, let's just go a little faster now, uh, looking for the earlier methods. They are not much used, but just for your knowledge, you should be aware of. They may be asked in exam, so I'll take you through. The open drop method and the semi open methods were the earlier uh, methods which were used in the beginning to deliver. And these were the equipments that were used. Uh, the first diagram is a shimmermus mask, which was covered with some gauzes. This is a Yonkers mask. This is uh, this this is, is the adapter of a uh, bottle, dropper of a bottle in which the anesthetic agents are there. And these are the Bellamy Gardner wire masks, uh, which uh, these liquid anesthetic agents were dropped onto this, and uh, the vapors were delivered to the patients with the inspiratory upward. These were little semi-open drop method, like Augustine mask with shimmer bust frame where the, they were wrapped with some amount of wash bases. And these are flag can where the drops of the liquid agent were dropped over these, and they were vaporized with the patient's inspiratory effort. And this is how you can see the actual uh, delivery of the open ether method, uh, which uh, even though I have not seen it, but I have seen these equipments uh, from a museum, and I've seen uh, uh, on manicures how they were being delivered. So this is how, uh, this is the shimmerable mask covered with uh, 16 layers of piece, and this is the bottle with ether, and then depending upon the concentration, the drops were given to these patients and they delivered it, uh, the anesthetic gases. Then to further improvement, this was the EMO vaporizer, which is called Apestin Macintosh Oxford vaporizer, uh, almost 70 years old now, uh, it works well. It is also a very good equipment for the field vaporizer. It can be used in the field. It can be carried and still being used, uh, especially in the uh, disaster area. So this is how, uh, when I said classification of the vaporizers, I showed you the classification earlier. You can use this classification of the vaporizers to describe this EMO, right? So when you see this internal structure of the EMO, uh, this is the control lever where you can set the settings. This is the inlet, there is a small hub here where you can mention, uh, you can put your fresh gas flows. This is the outlet where you can attach the circuit for ventilation to the uh, patient. You can see from this indicator that how much is the ether uh, uh, balance in, these, uh, in, in this uh, EMO vaporizer. Now it has a, if you see this small filler or you see this, this filler, this is the uh, port where you can use it for filling the ether into the vaporizer. Uh, this also has a temperature indicator because I mentioned that temperature uh, will change the output and hence it has a temperature indicator. So it will show a red band when the temperature goes more than 32 degrees Celsius. Along with the EMO, these were the Oxford inflating bellows, uh, which can be used. This is the inlet, this is the outlet. These are the uh, check walls here. These are the six bellows, each 150 ml. So you can deliver 900 ml of hydro volume to these patients. And uh, they are the unidirectional uh, check walls here. And sometimes uh, depending upon spontaneous versus uh, mechanical ventilation, uh, you can defunct this check wall so that uh, uh, this unidirectional world using a, this magnet, this U-shaped magnet. This is how uh, you can see this is OMB. This is, uh, this is EMO, this is OMB, that is, uh, uh, this is vaporizer, this is Oxford bellows, and you can see how uh, this gentleman is ventilating while the anesthesia surgery is going on. Uh, this vaporizer delivering gases, you can see it is attached here, 
uh, output goes to the patient. He is ventilating using this balloon. So this is how uh, this earlier uh, anesthesia anesthetic agent delivery so was supposed to be done. Now then we move on to the uh, uh, subsequent vaporizers. These are uh, the Oxford miniature vaporizers. You can see this is the uh, inlet. This is the outlet. There is the storage. You can see how much the liquid agent is here. This was uh, uh, whatever the agents, you can change this plate. So you can use it for halothane and other agents. And you can know this is the setting that you can use for, right? The classification that I mentioned you earlier, uh, based on its functionality, it is concentration calibrated flow over the temperature compensation, but supply heat. So something has to be done to keep it warm. Usually they used to wrap it with uh, some watch pieces and uh, uh, or sometime uh, with some thick clothes so that uh, the, it remains heated up. The next vaporizer is the Goldman vaporizer. This is one of the vaporizer which was very commonly used in peripheral settings. A small vaporizer, this is the chamber where you can where you can fill up the liquid agent and uh, this is the dial setting uh, which you can check up. And uh, this one side goes to the inlet or inflows and the other side goes to the outlet that is the patient hand. Uh, this is uh, concentration calibrated over without wick. You cannot see there is no wick here. So the gas flows here. They will pick up some anesthetic agents here and also very simple vaporizer. And uh, very was very commonly used in the uh, ancient times, right? So uh, then subsequently, this vaporizer was slightly modified. A wick was added to it. I said wick. The advantage of wick is to increase the concentration. It becomes young modification. If you want to give higher flows, for example, say, Induction with CO4 and you need some very high flow. So you can attach two vaporizers in series and it becomes a false modification. Uh, these are of various type, Mark 1, Mark 2, Mark 3, depending upon the, uh, the modification that happened and that's where these vaporizers, but they're not commonly used. Now then comes the uh, era of Boyle's apparatus, Boyle's machine, which many of us have used it. And if you see the back part, these are the Boyle's bottle. And uh, Boyle's bottle, uh, they used to have a chamber plunger where you can make them through bubble through. If you just insert this, the whole fresh gas flow from here will bubble through the liquid agent and goes out. And this is how you can increase the uh, output concentration of these agents. And then we moved on to tech two vaporizers. Uh, um, usually these are temperature compensated uh, vaporizers. So this is tech two with some more modifications, more safety features. The tech three vaporizers comes into market you can just remember this classification. I'm not going to detail. If you just go through your uh, DOSH and DOSH, you can see these uh, uh, these type of uh, classifications in these vaporizers. And then we move to TAC4 vaporizers, which again, uh, the classification is almost the same, but they have a filling mechanisms of the liquid anesthetic agents into them. And they have some input uh, improvements. Uh, we talked about the back pressure changes. So these TAC4 vaporizers were immune for those back pressure changes and they were not even affected by, they're not tipping them. If you just tilt them, uh, the output will remain the same and they're not affected. And then comes the Tech 5 vaporizers, uh, which has a dial wall on the top. You can see this is the filling. You can see how much liquid agent is there. This is the filling wall from where you can fill up the uh, bottles there. Now, the specific features of Tech wall is they have a buffer system here. You can see to increase the surface area, this buffling was done inside them and they have a biometric strip uh, at this area so that you can just uh, look at uh, the output of these vaporizers remains constant. Just to summarize uh, the classification for TAC1 to 15, you can just, these are the very overview of these classification of these vaporizers, variable bypass flow over break out of system, temperature compensated by automatic flow alteration concentration calibrated agent specific. So these are the commoner classification of TAC1 to TAC4. But now we have uh, TAC7 vaporizers, which is uh, having some uh, improved features. They have specifically filling devices uh, so that you are not able to fill them with the wrong agents. And that's why uh, I said that these are all agent specific. If you fill them with wrong agents because they are not calibrated for it, they can be damaged. And hence the safety features while filling them up has been taken care of. Now, this is the uh, vaporizer, uh, which is uh, specific because just when we talked about the boiling point, it's lowest, the saturated vapor pressure higher, 
So we need a, a vaporizer because they will take up a lot of heat and hence to maintain the constant uh, uh, constant output, we need a vaporizer wherein uh, they can be you know, controlled effectively so that the output remains the same uh, because of the uh, agent being extremely volatile. And hence this vaporizer is very specific. Tech uh, 6 vaporizer is very specific for dustware and it is only for dust and not for anybody else. And it's something like a gas vapor blender. So this is, uh, this is uh, needs to be remembered because of the low boiling point, something will be into the gaseous form also, and hence it will be more of a blender. So this is how uh, these vaporizers work, as I showed for you other thing. Now, this is how the fresh gas flows and goes into the system here. So these are controlled with electronic uh, uh, mechanisms based on the pressure that you're looking for. Now, here uh, the vaporizer unit of the dust spray, I said since it has a low boiling point, so some will be in the form of liquid, some in the form of gas. Now it is being controlled by pressure regulating valve. So depending upon the setting, dial setting that you have done at, depending upon the pressure, because pressure will be dependent upon how much flows you are giving it. So uh, this both will be controlled independently. And based on this working pressure and the flows, the controlled amount of the vapors of the dust drain will be going through this, which is a concentration control wall and getting mix, mixed up into the vaporizer outlet and delivered to the patient. So this is how the uh, Tech 6 vaporizers works up and that needs to be remembered. So these are two separate units, but they are electronic, electronically controlled. Sorry. They are electronically controlled, right? Now, this is what I just mentioned that uh, the electrically heated thermostatically controlled dust when, uh, concentration is being delivered to these vapors in a very controlled environment by two separate units right now if you come to the newer vaporizers uh, uh, these are the cassettes cassette based uh, uh, vaporizers which are being used in newer machines of uh, uh, detex remeda and gacs if you can see here there's a small slot right and this slot incorporates this cassette which is electronically and computerly controlled. And these are the various cassettes of CO dust which can be changed. This can be removed and put up here. And this is the bucket area where you can store the other uh, uh, cassettes of other agents, right? So this is how the Aladdin cassette preparations work. They are computer controlled, variable bypass, single electronically controlled preparation delivery in their area. They are flow over a type of method and they are controlled with electronic thermal compensation. So this is how they work out, right? Now, if you see the machine, they have two separate units. Inside the console, there'll be an electronic vapor control unit, and then there'll be a cassette that con con uh, contains the anesthetic agents, and they are detachable. So this is uh, color-coded. You can see it's different color-coded for this, and they are magnetically coded. So when they're inserted into the, into the, uh, the anesthesia workstation, they will be picked up, sensed, and accordingly, they will deliver it, right? Uh, they have a specific, if you see more closely, uh, these are the panel or the rear side of the vaporizer. You can see these are the inflows and outflows. And on the front, you can see this shows you how much liquid agent is there. And this is the filling port. And again, this is a safety mechanism. And this is the locking lever. So once you insert, they will not be loose and the case will not happen. And this is how the Aladdin cassette vaporizer works, right? I said this is electronically controlled. So what actually happens is, so once you dial some uh, dial setting here and the fresh gas flow is being delivered to these patients. So this will go to this bypass chamber and there will be some electronic circuitry here, right? And this electronically circuitry will control the check wall and they will also be controlling the pressure and the temperature because this will depend upon uh, the liquid agent, the duration of its use, and the how much fresh gas flow is going into the system. So this whole will be controlled by computer controlled uh, mechanism, and this will divide this into bypass chamber and the vaporizing chamber. Again, this is controlled, and this will be delivered after mixing to the patient outlet. And this is whole, you can see there are fixed registers here. There are fixed registers here. There's a temperature sensor here. There's a pressure sensor here. The flow control wall is as per your setting and is sensed by the uh, CPU of the computer. And this gives you a controlled setting as per your requirement to the output. This is how this works out.
This also has a fan because this requires heating up or cooling it up. Uh, so based on this, there's a heating fan here that delivers heat to these patients. Now this is uh, coming to the last couple of slides. This is the Macket injection vaporizer. Uh, this is an injector based vaporizer. What actually happens in these vaporizers is depending upon your flows, depending upon your dial concentration or output that you want from these vaporizers, you can set those settings. The vaporizer will be injecting amount of liquid vapor into the fresh gas flow and that will be delivered to the patient. So this is how it works like, right? This is how it works like. So this is how Macquarie injection vaporizer works like. Whenever the fresh gas flows goes into this chamber, right? Now this is the liquid anesthetic reservoirs. You can see the liquid indicator here. This will be the safety valve. So this will be sensed. Now there will be a sensor here. This will be sensed that how much is the fresh gas flow through this uh, dry gas inlet. And based on this, the injection sensor will sense it and will inject the liquids into this chamber. And there is a heater here. This heater will maintain the temperature and will convert this injected liquid into the vapors. And then it is being delivered to the patient through the fresh gas outlet. So this is how this McWay injection vaporizer works. And this is being used into the uh, newer machines. Regarding the hazards of vaporizers, uh, you should be you know, uh, cautious about the issues, most commonly the misfilling, but now uh, most of the vaporizers are uh, having uh, you know, systems wherein you can avoid misfilling because they are dedicated fillers, right? And that needs to be taken care of. Uh, overdose, underdose, uh, because if you fill them with wrong gases, uh, they can happen this. And that's why we have agent-specific filling systems. And these are the various filling systems. This can come into theory question also. But clinically also, you should know that these are the various agent-specific filling systems for the safety of filling a particular vaporizer with a particular agent only. And hence, you should remember it. They are also color-coded. That's why you can remember them easily. So these fillers are color-coded and you need to remember them. Also, if you see the uh, attachments, right? Uh, sometimes, uh, if you see your vaporizers, you can attach two vaporizers or three vaporizers. But if you see... Uh, once you open one vaporizer, you cannot open two vaporizers because if you open two vaporizers, your vaporizers, just not you are delivering two agents, but your vaporizers will also be damaged because uh, one agent, if goes to a wrong vaporizer because they are in series, then the vaporizer can get damaged and the output uh, which is being delivered to the patient will not be known because they are calibrated for single agent. And hence, uh, these type of safety mechanisms select attack back wherein and they are back pin. If you want vaporizer, it locks the other vaporizers. Uh, in regular lock, this, are, this is like a you know, mechanical locking system that prevents opening of only one vaporizer from the back bar if they are even more than one, right? Also, the, this is not a concern much and all, but you should know that uh, based on your vapor pressure, the sequence or the order of vaporizers on the back bar, especially in the older machines, this uh, used to be the issue. And hence, you should know the system of orders of vaporizers to be fit. I'm not going to details about this ASTM standards. I think uh, you can read any standard textbook. But uh, whenever these vaporizers are made, or when you are purchasing these vaporizers, you should be aware of those uh, standards provided by uh, the, uh, uh, the policy makers, wherein uh, when a vaporizer is made, they have to follow these ASTM standards. So I'm not going to detail. You can uh, check any of the standard books for reading those ASTM standards. Uh, and these are the safety features of constructing. So when you're purchasing them, when you're using them, you should check that all those things have been taken care of. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rakesh Gar. Very excellent presentation. In fact, uh, best presentation I have seen so far on uh, vaporizers. You have explained such a complex thing in a very simple uh, way and at the same time, very elaborated uh, 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 explanation. I think uh, all the 
participants would have benefited so i would request uh, participants to take advantage of it and ask uh, uh, their doubts to dr rakesh gar please now the session is open for uh, discussion and uh, question and answer students any doubt or discussion Kindly unmute yourself and you can speak. Participants, kindly unmute yourself. Uh, probably he has explained in a such a way that no participants have left with any doubts. Still, if anyone. Absolutely, sir. I fully agree with you. Sir's lecture has left exactly 100% clarity in on each and every aspect of uh, usage of library, sir, right from the basic physics up to the latest designs and the modulation safety features and the co complications that could happen by the day to day usage of appraisers. And uh, as such, uh, I have not requested him to deal with the other hazards of usage of different agents in appraiser in day to day practice, which can be harmful. On uh, day to day usage, like your other compound D factors and other things. I think uh, because you said weaponages, so I have not covered those aspects. Maybe. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can, we can discuss those things, or maybe subsequently uh, we can talk sometime about uh, the clinical uses of specific agents and their clinical implications. Uh, we can discuss sometime. Yes, sir. Uh, can I ask one small doubt, sir? Actually, TY is also becoming a very useful. Uh, uh, method and especially out of theater anesthesia, NORA, non operative uh, regions anesthesia. So, uh, what will be your uh, take on uh, the vaporizing uh, technology in future, sir? Like our uh, infusion pumps, there can be any smaller gadgets which can deliver calculated amounts of uh, inhalation agents, like uh, intravenous dosage. Uh, this is a good thing and um, a couple of uh, researches have been going on that whether they can be used in this modality. If we talk about the injector technique, injector vaporizers are available. So they are, they are the most sophisticated and uh, and the delivery is very much controlled. So uh, those uh, macuate injections are available. With regards to the intravenous, I think uh, uh, the clinical success is not achieved because uh, uh, how they will respond, what will be the response, but yes, the research is going on that whether these uh, anesthetic agents can be delivered in some way, uh, some way of controlled method through uh, intravenous routes or uh, just transtracheal route in some way and how they will be controlled and uh, how the output advantage uh, safety features will be coming up. The research are going on, but uh, let's wait for if they come into clinical practice. But yes, it's a, it's a very noble way uh, of uh, using them, but we have to wait for some more time for its uh, clinical utility. Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. Uh, can I ask one question, sir? And yes, ma'am. Uh, sir, uh, like uh, while purchasing... Alpa, your voice is uh, low, I think. Do something. Now, now it is okay, sir? Uh, better than earlier. Okay. Uh, can you hear me, sir, properly now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sir, uh, like uh, while purchasing, uh, we should follow like ASTM standards only. Like for India, are we are we following ASTM standards for every equipment, like for workstation and vaporizers, or yeah. for India, do we have some another uh, uh, another uh, standards we should be followed? I think this is an important question. Uh, uh, being a government hospital, uh, we have to follow certain policies now. And if you see last couple of years, uh, the government policy uh, has been changed a little bit for procurement into a public sector. 
So those, uh, since you all are working in public sector, so the policy change are a little different. If you remember, there is a portal, something called GEM portal. Uh, uh, so as in government, yes. uh, uh, public sector, we have to use a GEM portal. And in those, uh, if you see the government policy, they are uh, they are promoting Make in India uh, for various things. Uh, so uh, as an uh, administrator, we have to take a decision whether there is a uh, good quality competitor from India who manufacture that particular agent. Because in, in, in an SCI practice, there will be certain things which are very good from India. There are certain things which are imported outside and uh, assembled into India and distributed by Indians. And there are certain things which are imported totally from outside. So depending upon a particular equipment, you need to take a decision. Uh, as per the government policy, if you see, go through the gem, uh, mm -hmm. the many standards are mentioned there. And the government is improving day by day about various standards from uh, those standards. And if you see earlier, uh, maybe five years or 10 years back, we were looking for CE and FDA uh, approved products, but now they want that it should be approved by uh, base or uh, some of the Indian uh, uh, agencies. And uh, many of those uh, standards are coming from Indian agency. So I think uh, you need to have a comprehensive understanding for the variability and variety of equipment that we purchase in NSA practice. Whether we have Indian standards, if you don't have, then you need to specify during purchase that they are not available. And that's the reason that you are applying for it and go to the gem portal and look for whether they are available or not. So I think uh, in, in Anasia, we purchase drugs, uh, small equipment like IV cannula, anotracheal tube, which are available from Indian manufacturers to higher end machines like uh, uh, the Anasia workstations, which are uh, which are mostly imported or either imported parts with assembling into India. So that you have to look for those equipments and take a decision accordingly. Fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have made some questions in the chat box, sir. Like, uh, yeah, as you rightly pointed out, sir, the government policies have to be adhered to while we are making procurement for any government medical institutions, particularly defense purchase and medical equipment purchase involves a lot of importation and. Uh, uh, amidst this uh, Make in India policy, uh, how are we supposed to work it, work it around, sir? Yeah, I think this is an important question because uh, uh, the only thing is uh, with, with, uh, with the creation of the GEM portal, uh, if you just go to the GEM portal, there are many specifications which are already mentioned. So I think whatever your uh, uh, technical specification committee or uh, committee that have procurement committee that your institute have, so uh, the government issues them a standard uh, operating procedures for purchase of these equipments, depending upon the price also. So you can take a decision on them. Uh, be cautious that uh, whatever specification that you float should be a little more basic, that more uh, more competitors enters into it. And simultaneously, uh, from the quality point of view, uh, you need also you need to now put specifications in such a way that uh, they are more generalized, but they also specifies the uh, various aspects with regards to the quality of that particular product. So a specification should be made and somebody was asking that, is there some, uh, do we have standardized technical and commercial specification to help government procurement? Uh, government uh, uh, government uh, portal has uh, some basic uh, specifications which have been uploaded on government portal, which you can use uh, and they're updated time to time. Even in the GEM portal, uh, if you open a GEM portal and try to procure something, for example, say, let's say you want to procure, uh, procure the uh, video learning uh, So there will be some specification which has been pre-built into it. And uh, accordingly, you can uh, look for which suits to you. And accordingly, uh, uh, you can select those things and uh, you can have bidding system or uh, depending upon the price, uh, total price uh, of that particular equipment. You can bid or reverse bid, or you can do a tendering based on this. Yes, sir. And one more thing is, sir, uh, uh, how an anesthesiologist is supposed to check the vaporizer on uh, before daily usage, sir? I think this is an important question because uh, uh, this is one of the very, very important aspect of uh, the anesthesia practice. Before you start a case, you should have a check of various equipments and machineries and monitors that you are going to use. Uh, for the equipment, the uh, the newer workstations have something called an auto check. So when you switch them on, they will check step by step. At each step, you have to do something like you have to close the APL wall, you have to increase the flows, you have to attach the circuit outlet to the machine. So there will be a there will be a self check with proper instructions. So you follow them up, and in each step they will show you the outcome. Leak is less than 50 ml. 
the pressures are working okay. So this means that self check needs to be done. If you are using a very older machine, which are not electronically controlled, which are more of a manual, then obviously you need to check for the uh, the machine check uh, uh, procedures. I'm talking very older machines. If by chance somebody had them, like a boil separators, then you need to check them. The leak test is okay. Your vaporizers is attached appropriately. They are not leak. You are not smelling anything. It's not leaking. The sequence of vaporizers are appropriate. So if you go through your standard textbook, uh, uh, and even if you saw the Royal College of Anesthesiologists, there is a stepwise approach of uh, checking these equipments, including vaporizer. And those stepwise approach must be done to check for any uh, concerns, specifically the leak and uh, the uh, attachment of the vaporizer on the back part. That needs to be checked. Also, you need to remember that uh, whenever you are using this thing, uh, these things, uh, most of the newer workstations have safety mechanism of the filling. So the fillers and the bottles, they are color coded. And one vaporizer, which is uh, for a particular agent, will accept filler for its own kind. So don't try to uh, know, uh, bypass these safety mechanisms by using your own method. Sometimes I've seen that uh, people will, uh, if something goes wrong, they will try to modify and they will make some jogad and try to use them. Please try to avoid them because uh, this will create sometimes uh, unintentionally, obviously unintentionally, you will be able to uh, no, uh, load uncorrect drug, wrong agent into the other vaporizers. So use the manufacturer's uh, suggestion of uh, using them. And also for maintenance, uh, usually if you see the newer vaporizers, uh, they do not require much of maintenance. They are for five years, they work without maintenance until as they have some issues, they are not working well. Uh, they are not delivering well. So, until they, otherwise, they, are, they do not require monitoring, but most of these, when you purchase them, uh, they remain under a warranty of at least five to five, five plus five years, because most of the newer vaporizers have a lifespan of almost 10 years. So the company, uh, these all uh, vaporizers will be maintained and serviced by the company people, and they have a regular service. So when you purchase them, you, you just check for their uh, uh, servicing schedule, and accordingly, uh, according to that uh, schedule, you need to get them serviced appropriately. And once you find any fault, the company will change it. Don't try to change it. Don't try to modify it. Don't try to repair it of its own because uh, once they are being repaired, they require calibration and so forth, and the company will do it for you. So this is how uh, you should be cautious about uh, using, uh, the, especially the newer equipments because they are all electronic control. It's something like a newer cars, the newer electronic cars. Um, it, it cannot be done by any roadside uh, mechanic because they require a software to check which is the fault and they just repair the part. Same thing is for newer machines also. There's nothing called that you can repair a particular part. It is usually changed and hence uh, it's under, uh, it's usually under CMC of a particular company and you need to contact them as per the manufacturer's uh, requirement and repair them, service them as per the manufacturer. Don't do it yourself. Thank you, sir. One more thing is, as you mentioned, for cars, there is a class called uh, BS5 and uh, BS4, and now they have declared uh, the older versions uh, obsolete and obsolescence criteria have been clearly mentioned for even older versions of other non-life-saving uh, equipments in day-to-day -day life. But uh, is there any guidelines emerging like uh, ban on obsolete uh, equipment in vaporizer and analysis workstation, sir? No, I think uh, there is nothing uh, so-called guideline that you should not be using a Goldman vaporizer. You should not be using a Tech4 vaporizer. You should only use Aladdin or uh, uh, Macro vaporizer. There is nothing called uh, these guidelines. But that's why I think when I mentioned this slide, I mentioned that these are the limitation of older equipment. So if somebody is using them, you should be cautious uh, about uh, these equipments. That these are the limitations of these equipments. And you should be cautious while using them. That's why I was teaching them, uh, teaching uh, just shown some slides that these are the limitation of the older equipments. So we have nothing called a uh, uh, recommendation that uh, this equipment must not be used. I said even like for example, say EMO. EMO sometimes uh, it being used in disaster uh, uh, in the field uh, and a seizure practice. Though it is not being commonly used, but still it is in, in practice at some places. Even the boils machine is being used in many places. It's very common. So, uh, so I think there is uh, there is no guideline. But yes, uh, I must acknowledge and say that uh, the medical science is advancing on one end. We are doing a lot of sophisticated, advanced surgical procedures. On one side, we are moving towards a uh, robotic surgeries, 
endoscopic surgeries, and all those procedures have been done. So we have also to be moved to a more better and safer equipment. I will not say costly equipment, I will say safer equipment. So whatever you are choosing, it should be having a safety profile. So, uh, so I think we should uh, stop using the uh, equipments which does not have safety mechanism. Use equipment with a safety mechanism. And uh, in the newer equipments and many safety mechanisms, obviously there's a cost behind it. So depending upon your requirement, you can choose anyone. But the crux is whatever equipment or instrument you are using it, you should be aware of it, that how it works, what are its limitations, what are its technicality, and what are its shortcomings that you should be careful when you're using them. Are there any medical legal implications in using the older versions despite knowing the safety, uh, uh, the usage mechanisms and other issues involved? No, oh, I think uh, there is no guidelines or advisory uh, wherein uh, we say that if somebody is using, say, for example, a Boyle's machine for anesthesia uh, management, but if it is well maintained, well checked, if you maintain a logbook that this machine is checked and it is working fully, cylinders are full. If you have a basic check, there is nothing called uh, medical legal issues. But remember, uh, you should also be, as I mentioned, I'm mentioning again and again, you should also be aware of its limitation. For example, say uh, you are going, say, for thoracic surgeries, you are going for, say, one lung ventilation, and if you don't have an antidote capnography, if you don't have a monitoring of MAC value, and if something happens because of, say, uh, high delivery of the volatile agent becomes a high potential or something like happens. So this means the complication that can happen in that particular surgery, if you are monitoring them, your monitoring tool should be there. There is no supplement of saying that, uh, we are doing surgery, but we don't have mandatory tool. If you see the minimum mandatory requirement by Indian Society of Anesthesiologists, there is a there is a, uh, there is a guideline from ISA uh, National where they man, uh, where they uh, you know, mentioned about the minimum mandatory monitoring requirement. So those minimum mandatory requirement must be there. That is for all patients, irrespective of type of surgery. Then comes the type of surgical procedure. If you think for that particular type of surgery procedure, this is a standard of care. For example, if I talk about the one lung ventilation, I think uh, the, the minimum mandatory requirement definitely will be anti capnography. The minimum mandatory requirement is uh, will be requirement of a double human view for this patient. So if you don't have those things, if you don't have clinical parameters to check the correct placement of the uh, double human tube, then you are having medical legal issues. So you cannot, you should not be doing those cases uh, at your center. You should be referring them to a center where you have the facility. So based on the individual surgical procedure and perioperative need, the requirement of appropriate tool must be there. So that is one of the mandatory requirements. Similarly, like for example, say one lung ventilation, so you should be looking for the uh, peak airway pressures. So if you don't have a machine which monitors the peak airway pressures, then obviously uh, uh, it can have medical legal issues that why have you done those, uh, done this uh, difficult case? You should have referred to higher center. If you don't have machinery, equipments, and expertise, of getting this case done. So you should be cautious in this. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. It was uh, very, very enlightening and uh, very interesting uh, way of delivering a very complicated and confusing topic right from the basic to the latest advance. You have traveled through almost 150 years, more than 150 years in the history of anesthesia, starting from ether to the latest Aladdin and injector price, sir. And on behalf of Railway Anesthesia Association of IACI, I thank you and I congratulate you for uh, encouraging our students to become very versatile and uh, potentially safer anesthetists by your kind words. And uh, thank you. Thank you once again, sir. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you so yeah. much. And uh, I thank all the participants for your patient listening. And uh, on behalf of all of you, I uh, thank uh, Professor Nagasami also for uh, being part of this meeting and I thank our office bearers of Railway Association of uh, ASA and I uh, wish uh, uh, or, uh, we, we get very many occasions to interact with our leading teachers like Dr. Rakesh Gar, uh, so that we can enrich our knowledge and skills in, uh, in a big way and we can contribute to the welfare of our society. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you and all the best wishes to all the uh students or in case if you have any queries uh, you can communicate to sir or you can communicate directly to me also we'll try to help you uh, whatever way we can thank you so much and all the best for your uh, uh, study teaching and all the good work that you are doing thank you so much
Thank you, sir. With all the kind permission, I'll sign off this meeting today, sir. Thank you very much. Good day, sir.